What do you know about web security and FileMaker Pro? Hi, this is Don Clark of FileMaker Pro Gurus and FM Database Consulting. The following video is part three of a four-part series featuring Rosemary Teitke, a FileMaker Consulting Engineer. Rosemary presented at the December 2014 New Mexico FileMaker User Group Meeting and it's basically an updated version of her DevCon 2014 security presentation. So get ready. You'll learn all about the cyber threats you faced and the steps you need to take to protect your and your clients' FileMaker data. Enjoy. Yeah, so other things on point of sale is isolate. You know, if you've got a, a point of sale terminal in a retail establishment, only use it for POS. Don't browse the web. Don't use Facebook. Don't do anything else on those systems because, you know, that drive-by malware attack, really easy to pick up. And then all of a sudden, you know, your point of sale terminal is gone. We can in the same now. You know, and I think no, that's something business owners, I know that's something business owners don't think about. That does they're like using something like Lightspeed like for a point of sale. Oh. This is Creamland Eggnog. Huh. You know, the, the bottom line is making it to the bad guys to get into a device that accepts credit cards. You know, in short, follow PCI guidelines. You know, so this is a great, um, I don't know if you know, um, XKCD, the web comic. It's one of my favorites. So this is one um, from a few months ago about passwords. Um, you know, and one of the things that I learned, and this is one of my favorite ways to um, do it, is that, you know, using some, you know, pattern where you substitute, you know, substitute numbers for letters, you know, or shift them a little bit, um, kind of hard to remember. Um, it turns out that using a long string of like four unrelated words is a more secure password the actual than a password. Yeah. Yeah, actually, there was a hack done. Yeah. Uh, brute force attack, dictionary mm. attack on words, sentences, mm. basically. Yeah. From, uh, the one that did was the Bible. Okay. It well, it's not, no, that's the thing, is it's, you can't use a sentence. You have to well, use. No, it, it was, Random words. Random words. Yeah. You know, this one is, you know, but this one is like, you know, they're saying, you know, they're, they're looking at the entropy and yeah. longer to guess. So. Yeah, well, random words are better than a yeah. Than yeah. Yeah. No, but it's the, you know, four, four random words, not a sentence, but, but yeah. you know, and this is. And it still makes them up with that changing. I was, yeah, still, still add some, some extra randomness in there, but yeah. You know, the other thing that's interesting, and this is like more kind of human, human factors study is it turns out that, you know, everybody says you need a like 90 day password change window. Um, and actually, you know, that 60 to 90 day window is, is by some reports less secure because you know, if you go to 180 days, people are going to remember their password. And if you go much shorter than 60, to, if you go shorter than 60 days, you can't remember it long enough. And so that's when people write it down and put it on the post-it under the keyboard. Sure. You know, so. Exactly. Apple has nailed me on the ID so many times. I've got mm -hmm. a file of every single one yeah. that I've ever you know, <laughs> used. Had to replace. Yep. Yeah. So just one other thing. You know, next sort of big pattern is um, web application attacks. You know, and this is any incident where the attack was through a web application, you know, by exploiting a weakness or getting around authentication. Um, and most of these attacks, close to two thirds of them, were ideologically motivated, not financially motivated. Um, you know, and that's, you know, hackers defacing sites by exploiting holes in content management systems most frequently, Joomla, WordPress. Yeah, this would include that. Um, you know, hijack a compromised server and then hijack or compromise a server, either just deface a website or, you know, install malware so that when people visit that site, you get the, the malware. Um, the other third of the attacks are financially motivated. Um, and they're, you know, same tactics similar to the point of sale attacks to go after um, you know, a, an e-commerce site or a banking site. Um, you know, and there it's 
SQL injunction attacks, phishing to gain credentials, you know, all those other things. Um, so best practices, things you can do. Recognize that, you know, the web is a big attack vector. Um, and, you know, Verizon surveyed and found 78% of web servers contain at least one unpatched vulnerability and 16% contain an unpatched critical vulnerability. And this is data from March and April, like this is data reported in March and April last year, so this was pre Heartbleed, pre Poodle. So that's even higher now. Um, so, you know, one in eight sites have an unpatched critical vulnerability. And, you know, if, if an attacker is looking for a site to compromise, there's an awful lot out there that make it easy for them to gain access. Uh, the other big area of vulnerability is, um, the, is not just the content management systems, but plugins to content management systems. So if you're using WordPress for a website and you're using a bunch of WordPress plugins, make sure that as you update WordPress, you're also updating those plugins and making sure that you have the most secure version of those. Um, and another thing is use multi-factor authentication. Um, I've got a good friend from college who works for Facebook in their information as a security engineer, you know, and he, he advocates, you know, leave, you know, let the, the identity experts like Google or Facebook, you know, their, their protections on usernames and passwords are very high. So, you know, his, his position is there's no reason to, for a website now to, roll their own um, authentication scheme. You know, they can use the federated authentication or federated identity from Google or from Facebook just as easily. And that will probably be more secure. Why would we trust them? Well, I mean, that's the thing is, well, no, no. I mean, I actually, you know. They share. They do a lot of data sharing. Yeah. Data mining. Well, but they're not sharing they're they're mining activity and what you post yes. but they're not sharing disclosing mining the actual identity your yeah, your your authentication bits they protect those those are as far as there's they're concerned those are the keys to the kingdom and they take immense precautions with those um, but it's you know, you know someone's log in to pay. Right. Yeah, the metadata, yes, they're doing all kinds of stuff. You are the product. The metadata is their product. You know, you make a little posting, you just went shopping in the store. Yeah. That's, that's gold. That's platinum. Even better, we had a sick cat over the summer, and my husband, like, posted something on Facebook about buying baby food and paying attention to poop. And all of a sudden, <laughs> he starts getting... Targeted ads for diapers and <laughs> baby <laughs> things. Yeah. Yeah. Are it's, it's amazing. Their algorithm <coughs> used to track <coughs> and figure out because the money since mm -hmm. read about was this uh this uh I got a uh, email on uh, email from Target saying uh, for his daughter on Pampers and this and this. Yeah. And the dad was like, you know, he was furious that they were sending to his daughter. Well, the stuff his daughter was buying was uh -huh. actually much pregnant. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so other things, um, validate inputs to reduce the risk of um, SQL injection attacks. You know, FileMaker, WebDirect, custom web publishing don't require all that extra work. Just something to keep in mind. Um, and that's because of the unique unique nature of the FileMaker database engine. Um, so, you know, that's a question I get a lot from customers. And it's like, yeah, it's with FileMaker, that is not a risk. Um, so SQL inj injection attacks, where you craft an input in a web application, you're filling out a form on the web, yes. and you put SQL code into that, into oh, one of those fields. Yeah, yeah. There was an X case like way back, like uh, tables or something. No more data. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
FileMaker is not vulnerable to that, to, in, so to those kinds of data injection attacks. Why? Because of the way that, because the FileMaker, the core FileMaker database engine isn't a SQL engine. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it understands, but if you, even if you send, you know, an ODBC query to FileMaker, you know, it's, if you're doing it through a website, it's not going to interpret it as SQL. It's going to, you know, deal with it the way FileMaker deals with it. So if somebody has a FileMaker database that's in the web direct, and there's a, uh, mm -hmm. what are those, web fields? What is that? I forget what it's called now. Web viewer. Mm -hmm. Could someone put it in there? A SQL uh, statement in there? No. Well, I mean, in the web viewer, if that yeah. web viewer is going to some other site, you could there. But that's not going to impact your FileMaker server because the web viewer is going off to some other server entirely. It may affect it. It's going to a, another SQL database. Yeah. Because, you yeah, could, but not to it's not going to happen. To, that's not going to do anything to your FileMaker database. Or your yeah. yeah. Unless, of course, you have your FileMaker database inside the web viewer, that would be a huge cage. <laughs> but even then, it's not a risk because you're not yeah, well, I know you're not going that way. Yeah. The only way to get back even at your files mm -hmm. would be to run up. Yeah. Yeah. PHP inside the web viewer. That yeah. Still wouldn't work. Yeah, I talked about patching content management systems. The other one is monitor outbound connections from your web server. Um, is it sending more data out than it should be? Um, that can be a um, where is that data going? Um, that can be an indication that your server has been compromised. You know, even if they haven't compromised your site. You know, your server could be used as a um, host for an attack. Um, yeah, that's getting outside of what I'm really comfortable with. You know, it's sort of standard system administration tools. Look for, you know, just look at the traffic, look at the, look at the web traffic logs, the HTTP logs, and see what's going on. No, I mean, but that's not... I mean, here we're talking about web servers. It's it, you were talking about Apache and IIS, not FileMaker. So, you know, that's you know, monitor, monitor traffic. You know, last payment card. You know, credit card area is payment card skimmers. This is you know when the bad guys actually install a device on an ATM or another point of sale terminal, yes, gas, gas pumps. pumps. That's it. Yep. Read your card. Really. Oh yeah. Yeah. Discovered card, American Express. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, can't, I don't have a lot to say about this, you know, unless you're managing, a, you know, a fleet of point of sale terminals for a chain of gas stations. Truck stops. That's or truck stops. Down. Yeah. Pilots. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You get <laughs> well, those places are so wide open. Yeah. yeah. There, there are completely wide. Some, some trucker goes in to get a shower, and somebody, he leaves the truck unlocked, and someone goes in there and mm. grabs something that they can then uh, get into the, the gas pump with. It's yeah. You know, easy. again, Brian Krebs did a great um, article and all about skimmers posts in his series this spring in his blog where he had pictures of, of skimmers and, and other things. All right, so we've talked about a couple of those incident patterns, and now we're up to the crime ones. Um, and that's crimeware, cyber espionage, and denial of service attacks. Um, so crimeware, you know, it's a broad, Verizon categorizes this is a pretty broad category of incidents that don't specifically fall into other patterns like the point of sale attacks. Um, and in these cases, malware affects computers. Um, Usually to put them into a bot network of some sort, you know, to then bots can be used to steal credentials, you know, from you, when you log on to your banking site or take over the computer for a d distributed denial of service attack or spamming attack, you know, or another common vector is hijacking a browser to boost um, ad revenue on a site. So just take over the browser on your computer and send you to a bunch of, to a site over and over to boost ad revenue for something. Um, and an emerging pattern over the last 12 or 18 months is taking over a system and encrypting all of its data and then holding it for ransom. That's called mm -hmm. ransomware. Um, you know, but ransomware was up 500% in 2013. 
so up five times. Yeah. And, you know, that's um, Crypto Locker is one common version of that malware. Um, and it had inf infected over 200,000 computers worldwide, about half in the US. Um, and those criminals took in more than $27 million in ransom payments in their first two months of operation. So that's a big, big business. <laughs> yeah. um, and these days, you know, most crimeware inc incidents start via web activity. Again, downloads, drive-by infections, exploit kits, rather than by um, links to email attachments. You know, so again, it's you're, you're browsing a site, you might have a legitimate reason to be browsing, but that site has been compromised, and that's where you get that um, delivered. Um, and again, um, there may be some skewing of reporting on this because of um, mandatory reporting, but it's public sector, um, generally um, information, information services, consulting firms, um, and utilities are the big, biggest victims of this. You know, so, you know, this is where, you know, keeping browser up to date, browsers up to date, disabling in the browser, if you can, and if you cannot, keep it fully patched as much as you can. And this is another, um, you know, using two-factor authentication for, you know, those websites where you have your most sensitive information, you know, Gmail, um, your bank, and so on. What do you mean use two-factor two authentication? So that's, um, you know, Google has a, has a product for this and a few others where it's not just, um, a username and a password, it's, it's both, you know, two-factor authentication is something you have and something you know. So it's, you know, a password, but then we also send you a text message to your cell phone with an access code. Or it's like the crypto cards that we used for many, many years for VPN access, where you had that device with the random number that changed every second and you would go to log in and you'd type in that number at that instant when you were logging into the VPN. So, but as a customer, this is just for people setting up the server. No, 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 this is for you as a customer. You want to use opt for, if you have the option, select two-factor authentication. The way you have does it for you on the Mm -hmm. uh, they'll give you a code for you to put into your devices per device. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you only have to authenticate it once, but you can only get your mail from those devices. So mm -hmm. anywhere else that's trying to get in, right, can't, cannot get right. in. I have that when I travel. Mm -hmm. I travel a lot, and some some of the banks, they, they you know, if the MAC address of the router that you're mm -hmm. using is different than another one, they'll require you to, to get an email. A, a right, card, a, a yeah. It's, that's exactly what it is. So yeah. You have images. Okay. Yeah. You have 50 images and you got to pick one. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the other, the other piece of that is, you know, for things, for sites. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for those sites that offer it and where you've got sensitive information, Gmail, you know, Google, if you use Gmail, your bank, credit cards, things like that, use it if it's available. Yeah, well, that's just signing in twice. That's not necessary. iTunes does actually have a two-factor authentication option now, um, as well. Yeah, some of the issues like if you mm -hmm. don't always have the phone with you. Yeah. It's going to log in, and you're sort of kind of stuck. You know. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Keep it with you, though. Well, I can't for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, other things. You know, a good good user education campaign is is important. You know, and don't follow shortened links. You know, that's another one, a way to avoid shortened links. So you get those those links that are you know, bitly, yeah, you know, so they, and that what, what that does is it redirects to some other site. Yeah. They're always redirects. Your, at least on the Mac and the Apple, yeah. you have your thing over a few seconds that pops up. This, yeah. Sometimes they're, they're yeah. a quarter of your screen that's yeah. so long. Yeah, you know, so, you know, check those. Yeah. And even some of those, if you don't really look at them, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're not, you're yeah, you know, like one is, you know, make sure that the link is actually going to the site you think it's going to. Yeah. Have you seen anything about QR codes doing that same thing? Because you can't see from where it's going. Yeah, no, I haven't. I don't know. I mean, I just never use them. Twenty-seven million dollars. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, 
QR just code. don't get the whole QR code thing, but that's just me. Yeah. Usually you get prompted whether you want to open it and it shows you that URL. Yeah. Most of the QR code mm -hmm. But the QR codes will do MP3s, it'll do uh, phone numbers, it'll do no, the website. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're okay. talking about going someplace. I yeah. mean, uh, yeah, if I don't, it shows you the, the text. The full one, which, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, usually you get prompted whether you mm -hmm. really want to open that site or not. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of our uh, CPA's teachers in your class, she mm -hmm. sends the kids their QR code for some site they want to go to. Uh -huh. They just click on that and you know, they go put their phones off. So that's right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they can click on this. She also works. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Cyber espionage, not a whole lot of um, incidents, but pretty high ratio of disclosure to incidents. Success. Success, yes, data, data um, disclosures. Um, the biggest threats here are public sector. You know, again, maybe a reporting bias there, um, professional scientific and technical services, um, and manufacturing where the target is specifically intellectual property or trade secrets. Um, and, you know, if the attack is coming from outside an organization, almost all of those were attributed to state-affiliated actors. Um, and half of those in East Asia, so China and North Korea. Um, you know, and again, the, the route in is usually through the use of malware tools, almost always delivered through spear phishing. So, you know, again, it comes back to, you know, user education and being careful about the links you click on. You know, and they can also be internal um, or external actors. Um, you know, this is an older story that showed up in Ars Technica in February of 2013 um, that Facebook, a bunch of computers of Facebook engineers were compromised by a zero-day Java exploit. Um, and, you know, Facebook engineers were visiting a Java developer forum and they picked up malware from that forum. Um, and the attackers, so they had compromised the forum server and then whenever an engineer visited that, the malware got delivered onto their um, laptops. And then, you know, via Java in the browser, they got the attack. And the attackers were able to then explore the compromised laptops and tried to reach from those laptops out to other assets. Um, in this case of Facebook, um, they only got, they didn't, weren't able to compromise the rest of the network. They only were able to get things that were on the, the engineers' laptops, and so what they got was, you know, typical engineer system things like email, corporate data, and software code, but no customer information. But some companies' software code could be is could be incredibly valuable. I mean, that is the bank, right? Um, you know, and because it was a zero-day novel malware attack, their antivirus systems didn't pick it up immediately. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, the other alarming one, this came out, you know, right before DevCon. This, this was the cover story in Business Week in Jul late July about how Russian hackers stole um, NASDAQ. I mean, that was a really um, fascinating article and the investigation. 